Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Shini here, and this is my channel, Selling Name Automation and Java Learning with Shini. So, if you are new to this channel, I would strongly recommend you to go ahead and subscribe to this channel. Here, you will find a lot of free videos on Selenium, Java, Python, API automation. I will be starting soon. Robotics courses automation. So, just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell to get notifications. If you have any queries, you could drop me an email and just let me know what is your query and if you want me to take any video, I would be more than happy to help you. So today we are going to look at the topic of cracking the Selenium interview, the part two. So we have already seen the part one in our, our previous session. So if you are not gone over it, I would strongly ask you to go over it first because this is the continuation of the series and I'll be dropping a link for the same in my description as well as in this particular video, I'll drop a link for the same. So just go over it and then come back to this particular part two. So let's get on to the part two. So what we are going to look at the part two now. So in the part two, we are going to look at these all topics. These are very important topics from a Selenium interview perspective and I will be explaining whatever I could in this session because I don't want it to become a very lengthy and a boring session. So I would want to keep it short and crisp so that your guys will be able to understand and you know go step by step. But these are all key topics and you need to prepare yourself for all these topics for sure before you go for Selenium interview. So first topic is frames. So often my students and my other colleagues, they want you know to understand why is frame such an important topic. The reason is because in any web application, frames is a very integral part of it. And if at all an automation engineer isn't aware of why they are not able to solve a particular issue. Let's say they are trying to run an automation script and they get element not found exception. Now what does the element not found exception indicate? It just indicates that, okay, in this particular web application page, the current page, the element is not found. They might be scratching their head. They might be trying to ponder as to why they are getting this error. And they might be, you know, thinking why they're getting this error because the locator is correct. The XPath or the whatever form of locator used is correct. They have already inspected it in the web application window. Then why is it they are getting the error when they're running the script? The simple answer for that is that many a times we often try to ignore that it's a part of a frame. And that is why we land up in element not found exception because the web driver isn't yet gone to a particular focus or a particular area where that element is a part of. So you have to instruct the web driver that you have to go to that frame. You have to go to the element within the frame. So the first step is that you have to know how to switch to a frame when a particular page has a frame as a part of it. So we will be looking at as to why what are frames you've already seen now? How does it work? We are going to see the practical aspect of it and we'll just take an example of the same. So I'll just show this particular website. So there's a website called Tools QA and they are having a very good example given with respect to finding out if a particular page, let's say, has a frame, then how do we go about it? So as you could see here, the frames are indicated most of the times in a website using iframe tag. So if you would want to find out if a particular application is having a frame or not, I'll be showing two examples here. So let's take example of Facebook, right? So I've already made the inspector on. Now let's just try to inspect the element, let's say the email or phone. Here we see it's a part of TD tag and let's try to go further up. It's a part of table. It's a part of form. It's a part of div. If you see here, it's highlighting the entire content. Let's go again further. Then we have HTML body. And I think that is it. So we don't have any particular tag as such called as iframe or frame. And now we have scrolled down to the complete top. We have HTML and the head tag. So this indicates that this particular current page of Facebook doesn't have any frame involved. Now let's look at another website of this particular tools QA. Here, let's try to click on right click and let's try to inspect. Okay, so if you notice here, we are having this iframe tag. So I'm just going to scroll down a bit so that I can show you all how it is locating it. If you just do a mouse over on the iframe name equal to iframe one, it is highlighting the first left hand side portion a section that is the frame one. So it's the indicated by iframe tag and the whatever content comes within it. If you collapse it, you can see a lot of content have got 
collapsed here. If you just expand it, you can just come a bit below and you can see whatever content we are seeing within this particular one, like this particular links and all. Right. See, if I just try to go to content, see this is skip to content link. There might be a lot of hyperlinks here. So let's try to look at this one. So I'm trying to highlight what all things are a part of this particular one. So if you look at this, this all are a part of your iframe one. These all areas are a part of your iframe one, right? So if you want to do any particular interaction with this particular, so if I just do a right click on this online training, let's say for example, I've inspected the element. This is the span tag. We'll just go further up. It's a part of list items. And this is, it's the highlighting the area where it is belonging to. It belongs to the left hand side frame. I'll just go top. And you can see now that everything of this is belonging to this iframe one. So if you have to do any interaction within the iframe one section, you have to first switch to the iframe and then only you will be able to interact with it. So the way how to do that is that we have to write a simple piece of code. Of course, we need to have a driver. And for that, you need to have your selenium jars and other supporting jars as a part of your build to your project. So I'll just show it to you all what I'm talking about. So if you go to build path, go to configure build path, and you would be able to see there are a lot of jars available here. So these are all supporting jars, which I would need to have in my project for doing any interaction with Selenium. And I have other supporting jars like POI for Excel interaction, which is not exactly required for this particular case. But in general, it's good to have all these jars in one folder and then add it to your project. So I've just instantiated a driver here. So web driver, I've declared it here. Now, it depends upon what particular browser you're using. If you're using a Chrome browser, you have to first set the system property. So you can just set the system property before you use your Chrome driver variable. And now you have to give a path as to where your driver is located. So I'm going to put the address where my driver is located. So it's located in my desktop. I'll just put the location here. Then you have to use your, which driver you want to launch. So I'm going to launch Chrome driver. So I'm going to say driver equal to new Chrome driver, right? And then you have to just store this, whatever URL you're going to launch in a variable, right? So we are going to launch now this particular website. So I'm going to store this particular URL in my application and now what you have to do is you have to use this driver so firstly I'm going to set up my implicit weight and just I'm going to set up my timeouts here so I'm going to set up my implicit weight so if you have not gone over my previous sessions on selenium I would just ask you to go over those to understand in detail about what are these timeouts and everything so this is about the implicit timeout and this I'm going to set the page load timeout what is the maximum time I would want my web page to wait until it gets timed out or throws an exception. And then finally, we would want to maximize the window. So I'm just going to maximize the window and I'm going to get my URL. That is my application, right? So this is the basic steps we would want to launch the application. Now, once you've gone to the application, we would want to switch to the frame. So we use a syntax driver dot switch to, this is the syntax we have to use to switch to a frame we have to use this particular method called frame. Now, if you notice here, there are three different methods. This is why I was trying to show you through this code practical part. What is a part of frame? So there are three ways to identify or go to a frame. You can go by the frame index. That is, if you see frame one, frame two. So it starts from zero, it starts from one. So I'll say, let's say frame one, we want to switch to. Okay. What is the other way to go about? Other way could be the name of the frame, right? The second part, the name of the frame. So we can go about what is the name of this frame. So if you look at this name attribute is iframe one. So I want to go as per the name attribute iframe one. Or the other thing could be you first try to create a web element for this particular frame. That is you create a locator with this particular one. So let's create a XPath. 
with this particular iframe. So I'm going to say iframe. You can use even star at the rate name equal to. Yeah, so it's able to highlight my frame and it's a xpath. So you can store this into a web element. So you can store it in a web element frame one. And I'm going to say driver dot find element by dot xpath. Give the xpath here and that's it. Import the web element and then use the switch to dot frame and use a third syntax. So this is going to be frame one. So these are the three different ways you can switch to a frame. So hope you found this first part uh, useful and how to switch to a frame. You can go by the index. You can go by the name of the frame. On the third part is the element of representing the frame. Right? So these are the three ways to go about switching to a frame. Now the next interview question is about dynamic XPath and XPath access, right? So what is a situation where, you know, we might have to use a dynamic XPath or we have to use XPath access is the common interview question being asked. So what do we need to tell to the interviewer? Right? So there are situations where it is very difficult to find or you would notice that for the particular tag, there is no ID, class, name or any commonly found attributes within a tag. So it's very difficult to find the XPath with respect to the whatever other attributes are left or it could be the case where multiple elements are being located with the same kind of values which are there for the tag so it's very difficult to uniquely identify one element out of the multiple right so the way to do that is we have to use xpath access that is to precisely indicate which element we want to interact so i have already uploaded a video recently on the XPath access both part one and part two covering entire XPath access that is sibling that is following sibling preceding sibling parent child right we have ancestor so you can we have descendant so you can go over those couple of videos and you will be able to understand that concept and how you can explain to the interview with particular proper example and I'll be also creating one more video where I will be showing to you all how the XPath other ways work about. So there is other methods like starts with. There is another method like ends with, right? And there is contains. That is if you want something as a part of, let's say a text having something, let's say selenium, right? So this is how you would be using it within your XPath. So I'll be creating a video on this shortly and you will be able to refer that and understand the concept, right? So let's stick on to these concepts which are to be covered in this today's session. Right. The third important part is JDBC. So this is a very important question guys because JDBC I have seen personally myself the candidates are not able to answer. They are just telling a simple answer that we have to connect to a database. We have to basically create a connection. We have to execute the statement. We have to process the result set and that is it. So they are not aware of what are the underlying steps the interviewer would want to know what is the technicality of how are you able to establish a JDBC connection step by step they are not looking for an answer a theoretical kind of or the process kind of they are looking for a practical answer they might even ask you to write down in a piece of paper or if it's an interview over the telephone they would ask for the exact syntax so we have to be pretty much ready with these kind of questions and also prepare for the same so what you have to do is you have to create a you have to basically create a code for the same right so i can just try to show it to you all like how it is to be done so you basically are going to have here the connection to be created between between that particular database right whatever database you're going to use so for that you need to have a connection string so you are going to create a variable called connection string Let's for the time being initialize it and then you're going to have a username. You're going to have a password. All right now the very first step what you need to know is that I just want to comment it here. The very first step to understand with respect to JDBC right, is that you need to first load the driver. So you are going to use this particular class dot for name. 
right? And you have to mention what exact driver you're going to load. This is the very first step which you have to do. And you will be required to do this particular thing, like put it in a try catch. Otherwise, it will give you, it's like a checked exception, class not found. That is why it is forcing you to handle it. So you can handle it through throws or you can handle it through try catch. For the time being, I'm using throws, but I would recommend you'll use try catch, put this in a try catch block. Just to make the code cleaner, I'm going to use throws for this example. So you're going to use throws here. So you're going to use this oracle dot jdbc dot driver dot oracle driver because you're going to connect to oracle database here. So you have to load the driver for oracle. If you're using MySQL, the syntax will vary. But if you're using Oracle, the syntax is going to be this way. You have to mention what exact driver you're going to use and you're going to use Oracle here, starting with Oracle. Now the steps two would be, we have to prepare a connection string, right? So the syntax for the same is that driver manager dot get connection. And you are going to use a third particular syntax, string URL, that is the connection string, username and password. So you're just going to pass out these values. And this is going to give you a connection object. So create a connection object. So I'm going to create that connection object at the method level. I'm not going to just have it there itself. I'm just going to say for now separately as null. I'm going to initialize it to null and I'm going to store it here. All right, so we've got a connection object. Yeah, so we need to put this connection string here. Now this connection string is the most important part. Right, so we have to mention a proper value here. If you don't mention a proper value, your connection is not going to be established. So you need to ensure a proper value is given. So you're going to mention the proper values here. So JDBC, colon, Oracle, right, colon, then this is the driver you're going to use colon at the rate local host. So what is the IP address with which we would want to connect, right? Colon the port number with which we would want to connect. And then what is the service provider we are going to use? So this is how the connection string has to be given. So it would vary, vary from person to person. What is their IP address, right? So you have to use the port number here and you have to use a service provider here, whatever SIR ID you see when you try to connect to Oracle you have to provide those values here. So I hope you have got this particular connection string understood. So JDBC is that you're going to start creating a JDBC connection to the Oracle database using the driver thin. And then you are going to give a username and your password or your schema, whatever you'd want to connect. Right. So it's just again handling another type of exception of SQL. So again, I'm going to go ahead and use throws clause for this example. So it's going to do it this way. Right, so once you have created the connection, what you have to do, you have to basically execute a query, right? That's the third step which the interview would expect from you. How are you going to go about executing your query? So you have to say, we have created the connection object. So we are going to execute the, so basically first we have to create a statement. Yeah, so you can just tell to them that you're going to create the statement. So I'm just going to place down the steps here. So creating, Firstly, it's about loading the appropriate, appropriate driver is the first step. Step two is about creating a connection using connection string, username and password, right? And step three is creating the statement. So we are going to say con dot create statement, right? And we are going to store this into our statement objects. It's returning a statement object. So we are going to create a statement object here. Right. And this as well, we would want to put it into here. Just going to keep it initialized to none. Okay. So we've created the statement as a third step. The step four would be to execute the query and store into result set. This is how you have to explain to the examiner so that they 
sorry, the interviewer so that they are able to understand that you have understood the concept and you are also able to write down the syntax. So you can mention, let's take an example of employee. There is a table, select star from EMP. This, if you do a mouse over again on execute query, it's returning you a result set class object. So you have to create the object of result set. Again, as a practice, you would be creating it above. So I'm just going to create an object of result set, right? I'm going to use it here. So it's going to give you the result set. Now you have to iterate over the result set. Iterate over the result set and print the output or retrieve the output, right? Whatever you would want to tell this way, retrieve the output from the table. So that is why the step five becomes important. And now how are we going to do that? We have to use while loop, right? And you have to use this result set. So what we are going to do while result set RS, if you see here, it doesn't have any method like has next, unlike what we have in case of collections. If you're aware of collections concept in Java, we have as next just to verify if it is having next record. So you have to go for next method here. So as soon as you say RS dot next, it has gone one step further into the cursor has got one step further. So you're now from uh, your first particular record in the particular result set. So you can start accessing whatever data you would want to access. So you are going to say system order print LN and just try to see what particular column you want to print the data. If you want to print the first column data, let's say it is in string format. You go for get string method and let's say the column index would be starting from the first column would be zero, right? And if you would want to give a space, let's say, and if you can mention a text here, let's say column one, if you want to mention the column name, just do this way. And now you can mention here as column two, right? And here you can mention what other way you would want to get about. Let's say that is a integer. So you can use get int and let's say two. Now, if you would want to go for some other method as well, you can surely go about it's just that you have to know how to use it. So you're going to say RS dot uh, get. So let's see what is the string. So we, yeah, so we would want to get, let's say get string, yeah, string column name. So if you have the column name, let's say the column name is name. So this is going to give you the data retrieved whose column is name. So this is how you're going to iterate over the result set and print it. You can also store this data into some collection. If you'd want to one by one, you can add it to the collection. You can create a list or you can create whatever you would want and you can store this one by one. So this is the first part of this particular tutorial session uh, of the cracking the Selenium interview because this is going to be very detailed one. So I have split it into multiple parts. So hope you like today's session. I'll be continuing the remaining questions in my next session. Stay tuned and do watch my channel and subscribe to it. Thank you so much.